and welcome to this episode of Attitude. I'm Mary Arnott, your host and producer. I'm very happy that you're watching because you're going to really enjoy the show today. For background, Bostonians celebrated the 100th birthday of Fenway Park in 2012, a significant cause for celebration indeed. However, we in Hopkinton had even more reason to celebrate. My guest today is older than Fenway Park, and if I might add, he's more fun and a real inspiration. I'm very happy to welcome Sterling Hager, Hopkinton's Golden Cane resident, who will be sharing 100 years of living history. Before we get started, I want to say a big hello and happy birthday to my mom, who's turning 90. Mom, you have a decade or more to catch up to Sterling. Welcome, Sterling. I'm so glad you're here. I wondered who was going to talk to your mother, whether it be you or me. Oh. <laughs> well, I had to give her a little bit of a happy birthday before we get started. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Yeah. I now, I understand you're a country boy and a city boy. Yes, I... So you I, want to tell us a little bit about where you grew up? Yeah, I spent uh, the first 12 years of my life in, in Somerville, in the city, and... I, I did live with my parents for a couple of years in Fitchburg, which I don't remember very much, but at the age of three, I moved in with my grandmother and I lived with her for the next nine years. And uh, so it, it's very citified in Somerville. Some of the city things that I remember, I never forgot seeing the fire engines go up the street drawn by a uh, a pair of our team of horses with a steam boiler on it and when I went up I could see the fire underneath the boiler they had to use a steam engine to run the pumps when they went to a fire they hadn't motorized their fire department in 1920 1999 and uh, they uh, it, it is quite a sight to see a pair of horses galloping down the street that didn't last very long but I remember it and in the summertime, because we use streetcars all the time, in the summertime, the, the, uh, they had summer cars where it was all open on the sides, the seats in the middle, a running board on each side for the conductor to walk back and forth, collect the fares. And I remember riding on that out to Lexington and back with my grandfather. And it's just like riding in a convertible. It, it, much different than we see in a streetcar now. But after that only lasted, I think, about a year. They, they uh, later on, they disappeared. But, uh, it, it was just strange too. Even though we, it was very citified, we didn't have any electricity. We just had gas in our house, so our lighting was from gas and, and gas fixtures, and of course, the gas stove, and and we burnt coal in the furnace, and uh, oil lamps or. Uh, no, no, they had gas lamps. You had the they, gas lamps? Yeah, they had some, what they call a gas jet, which is just a slit and a flame come out. Then they had things you put a little mantle on, a cloth mantle, and when the gas went in there, you got a pretty, a pretty bright light. But I didn't think of it before, but they had not electrified the house where I stayed, even up till the time I was uh, about, see, 12. I was 12 years old, I left there, and and I don't ever remember them getting electricity, so I don't know, we just didn't have a radio then, because they didn't have electricity. My I went to school, three, a three minute walk to school, uh, school was just around the corner, so I came home for lunch every day, and then and went back. Not a school like you see today though, I imagine. Well, it was a 12 room brick building and I went back there many years later still there they're still using it for a school it was built the same year I was born 1911 how was school back then you were telling me some stories about how the children helped each other well that when that was when I was in a one-room school mm -hmm. when when I moved to the country uh, I still had a couple of years of grammar school left seventh and eighth grade and uh, they had four schools, one, four one-room schools in town, one for the young kids and one for the middle aged. so that it really wasn't too bad. You didn't have 
first grade to eight, they had split it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But one teacher did have to teach uh, quite a few, and there were never more than nine or ten in the, in the building at one time. What memories do you have of when you moved out to the country that you'd like to share with us? Say that again. What memories of the country living would you like to share with us when you moved from the city to the country? Well, it's, it's a different ball game. Um, you know, the town that I moved in is a very small rural, about 600 people or less living there. And uh, of course, uh, we used kerosene lamps and uh, uh, our well used to go dry in the summer and we haul water across the road from yeah, during the dry period. Um, one of the things that people don't realize now was a lot of work. Every, every meal that, that we had to do any cooking, every meal and every morning we had to build a new fire in the kitchen stove. All the cooking, all the cooking was done on a, on a, a kitchen stove, a range, but we had to burn wood in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's some advantages. I have to say, when you make a piece of toast on top of a wooden stove, it has a flavor that has never been duplicated by the electric toaster. A good one, I hope. <laughs> very, very tasty and nice, even job. The um, we we well, when I went there, my great aunt was the woman that took care of me. She was about seventy, and I thought that was she was ancient then. But she took good care of me. But any time we had to go anywhere, we went by horse and buggy. Uh, she didn't. She couldn't drive. We didn't have a car, and we had a, a horse across the street. They let us use. So when we went to a store or we went to church, it was with the horse and buggy, until I got to be 16 and got my license, and then we bought a car. <laughs> Do you remember what kind of car it was when you were 16? Uh, oh yeah, my first car was a, was was a Model T. And uh, I, I also had been given a Model T that we drove around on the farm. It was a little bit older. But uh, that was, a Model T was a very crude piece of machinery. But compared to the horse, it was wonderful. <laughs> a big yeah, I think there were some advantages, big probably. You know, a Model T didn't have any oil gauge or, <laughs> or it, it didn't have a fuel pump. It didn't have a water pump. It didn't have a heater. Uh, you, to check the oil, you had to get down the ground to open a, a little petcock. If it came out, you had enough, and if it didn't, you had to put some more in. And, and uh, it had a funny thing on it, though. Um, there's a little valve in the front in the driver's section, and if, uh, if you ran out of gas, you move it over to the other position, and then you'd, you'd be in where you had another gallon left to go. So then you could start up again and go. That was the only way you had of knowing you were going to run out of gas, except that any time you wanted to check the gas, you'd take the driver's seat out and open a cover and stick a stick in. And if it was wet, you had some gas. You know, that, that <laughs> was darned. Yeah. And of course, the windshield wiper, you had to do it by hand and uh, things, things like that. But uh, the, I, I, I think the, the life in the country changed quite a bit after I'd been there a few years, they put a power line finally through our street. And once we had electricity, that made country living a, a, a lot differently. We, we, we got our radio right away. We got our electric stove. And uh, uh, that was, that was a, a big improvement. From then on, we were glued to the radio at supper time. Lowell Thomas was the news commentator in those mm -hmm. days, and and no, I don't think we, I heard any newsmen since then that was equal to how well he used to deliver the news. And after he was through, a comedy came on, Amos and Andy. I think a lot of the old people remember Amos and Andy and mm -hmm. uh, the Kingfish and Madam Queen. 
um, we never missed that. I mean, that was a ritual that uh, we were always sure. The rest of the time, daytime and stuff, we didn't, we didn't turn it on. One of the wonderful things about radio in those days, you had maybe one commercial per program, two maybe at the most. We weren't, weren't flooded with commercials as it is now. You could enjoy a program almost all the time and not just 10 minutes out of 15 minutes. Yeah, I think our radio and TV stations could take a lesson from that. Less commercials, more programming, well, please. I noticed. <laughs> not that, HCAM, of course. We do a great job here. Yeah, I noticed they're complaining <laughs> now about the drop in TV listeners, but that may be due to Facebook and a few other things. Mm -hmm. I don't look at, I don't look at uh, uh, TV except at some of the documentaries put on by uh, public broadcasting station and, and uh, occasionally uh, for the weather, but mm -hmm. I've had it. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not attracted to it anymore. <laughs> the, um, I say when I got 16, then then we bought a we bought a bought a car, and my my aunt then was able to visit all her old friends. Now that her grand nephew could drive her around, and that was that was a room. But of course, we had no refrigeration. Um, uh, if we bought meat or fish or something, we ate it the same day. We didn't, we didn't try to keep it overnight. And. Uh, but when we had the electric stove and could then cook without building a fire every morning, that was a, that was a great treat. You were also telling me a little bit about, uh, of course, you're even too young to remember World War One. But you had a, you told me about a memory with your dad about the ending of World War One. Oh yeah, yeah you I was about I was about six years old when the armistice was declared, mm -hmm. and he came back from his training camp in air, he, he ne never went overseas. And when armistice was signed, he took me out on the front porch <laughs> and he wanted, me, he wanted me to cheer with him and, and, and celebrate. And of course, I didn't know how to, at six years, I didn't know how to cheer. I felt kind of awkward, but I remember standing out there trying to cheer and celebrate the armistice <laughs> that, that uh, he was uh, happy to celebrate. Anyway. I I don't remember too much of the of uh, World War One. I. I do remember uh, that uh, we had a flu epidemic, and I lost a couple of brothers from whooping cough and the flu when they were about one year old, and I guess that was quite common in those days without modern medicine to fight it off. The uh, there was a significant epidemic of flu in World War oh, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. the percentage of people, uh, almost every family lost somebody from the flu. Mm -hmm. you, when you go through the cemeteries, you, 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 you see that. Uh, it's very, very noticeable. A lot of those stones are from the flu epidemic period. Mm -hmm. Well, not to dwell on, on terrible things all the time, but uh, one of the things uh, you had mentioned to me was some memories you had of the Great Depression and how things were for people yeah. back then. Yeah, because we've been we've been going through a depression or a recession now where jobs are scarce. But the the that the the regular depression that was uh, every, seems so every I don't know anybody who had any money. Just no, every family w was poor, and I remember when. Um, uh, Roosevelt got elected. Uh, of course, the country town I was in is largely uh, a Republican, and Roosevelt was a Democrat. And I remember when he got elected, the natives were very unhappy. They were they, they were very downcast. And, oh, now we'll have grass growing in our streets, and oh, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> and of course, it never worked out that way. Uh, Roosevelt did a great job. Of, of getting the country through a very uh, tough time, and uh, when when I moved uh, back, I, when I moved back to Hopkinton in 1940, the depression was still uh, on, and the company I was working for used to give Christmas parties to all the employees. And I remember coming back from a Christmas party one Christmas, we were all standing on the curb waiting for the bus 
to pick us all up to bring us back to Hopkins. And, and I still remember the clothes they had on. Nobody had any new clothes on. They looked like a ragtag outfit, but that's how poor everybody was. And uh, that, that, that was a, a terrible time. Uh, of course, uh, before I moved uh, to Hopkinton, they, I was still in the country and the government paid uh, people to paint the town hall, fix the school windows, cut down the diseased apple trees to give the farmers and people some work to do, a little bit of income, and, and money that we earned. In fact, I did some painting under the uh, uh, NRA, WPA w program yeah, too, program. yeah. And uh, that, was a, that was a great help, and it worked out very well. So speaking of presidents, because you mentioned Roosevelt, did you, do you have a favorite president in your lifetime? Who's been your favorite? Oh, I thought Truman was pretty good. He didn't fuss around. He didn't seem to fuss around with uh, red tape. He, when he wanted something done, it was done. And then I also was happy to know that he had a great backstop. His wife had a lot to do with his being a good president. She was pretty pretty uh, bossy, and the two of them made a, a great pair. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, under the thumb of any particular uh, party, although when he got elected, people said he won't be a good president. He couldn't even run a clothing store. He won't be able to run a country, but he did. He did a good job. He had a good wife, huh? and I understand you were happily married for, what, 72 years? Uh, at least that, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I never... I, I never could understand uh, why so many women and men would come to work and the first thing they do was complain about their husband or complain about their wife. I finally reached a point that says, am I the only happily married man around here? Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, it's, a, it's a, I don't know, a matter of luck, I guess. Uh, but uh, I, I was very fortunate. And Very I think funny. you had a funny story you told me about your wife and uh, a car that you bought. Oh, yes. When, when the Germans sent the Volkswagen over here, it was a lower price car. And uh, you get much more miles per gallon. And, uh, uh, but, but, but they were ugly looking. No question. They didn't look like anything that we had ever seen as a car. The Beetle, huh? That's the Beetle, the yeah. The Beetle, yeah. And so I, I was thinking of buying one, and my wife said, well, all right. You can you you can buy one if you want to, but don't expect me to ride to church in it. <laughs> but she did eventually, right? She eventually had one for herself to drive. Now I have to ask, since we're talking about cars, how has the price of gas changed over the years? Oh, I forgot <laughs> to tell you. During the depression, you could buy seven gallons of gas for a dollar. Seven gallons for one. Seven for a dollar. Yes. All right. It's un seems unbelievable I now. hope the oil companies are listening. <laughs> Let's yeah. Get when, this price down. <laughs> yeah, when, when the Beetle came out, I remember you, I bought gas a few times, and one time the, the guy filling up, he says, you guys, with these Beetles, you're, you're ruining the gasoline business because we got a lot more miles per gallon mm -hmm. than the American cars were getting. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself, too. What did you do as a young man, professionally or... Oh, after the Great Depression and everything, when jobs started. I was I was kind of lucky. Um, the first year I was married, I well, I, I had an egg group uh, to start off with, earned about fifteen dollars a week. But we lived on that during the Depression. Wow, fifteen. And then uh, I got a I was, had a friend in a in a furniture factory where they made piano stools and piano benches, and they got me a job in there, and so. For five years, I worked spray and paint and uh, um, uh, dyeing uh, benches different colors until one day I found out that I was colorblind. My walnut colors were not going over very well, and I took one of these Japanese tests with all the color dots, and when it came to the yellows, I was dead in the water. I said, I bet I get another job. I shouldn't be staying in benches when I'm colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the, I, I did, I, I looked for other jobs. And um, I saw an ad from uh, General Electric in Ashland here looking for uh, spray painters. 
so I came over and, and they interviewed me, but they said, well, you know, you've just been spraying wood. We, we don't think, we want somebody who can spray metal. It's, of course, there's no difference, but so, I, okay. Now I had my hand on the door to go out. I was just going out the door and the uh, girl that we interviewed me said, well, wait, maybe, maybe we, we can try it. Maybe we, you, you, you'll be able to learn to do it because they were desperate to find somebody. So they hired me for six weeks during the rush season, they, they, and I, I worked, uh, I was on the night shift in six weeks. And of course, I kept, and the fifth week, it is, am I going to be laid off? Am I going to be laid off? And they didn't know, they didn't know. I ended up working there 12 years. It was, it was a long six weeks. A long six weeks, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And during that time, I, I did some more studying. I'd been to college for a little while. I, mean, I did some studying, and I became a supervisor of the time study department in a branch plant. And I, the girls that figured the people's peace work earnings were under my supervision. And so I, I, I learned to trade thanks to General Electric. But I left General Electric because when I went, I was studying nights all the time, and they wouldn't buy my books. And my friends worked for other companies, and their companies bought their books. So I quit General Electric. I went to work for another company that bought my books. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I became a, a cost reduction engineer and uh, methods engineer. That was what I did the rest of my life. Now, you and I were talking over at your home not too long ago, and uh, I think it's a real inspiration. You were telling me a little bit about what you do with your days now and your attitude toward life. Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, break it down. Make it a little one. <laughs> I, um, well, after my wife passed away, of course, that calls for qu quite a few adjustments. And... Uh, but I've, I've always had a, a few hobbies. So uh, today I read the New York Times uh, every morning and I download it onto my Kindle. And uh, it's so easy and there's no ads with it. Uh, I, I do a crossword puzzle every morning just to see whether I'm losing my marbles or not. Oh, you're sharper than I am. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I think of uh, the thing that's helped me the most, the thing that's really kept me alive more than anything else, is I love uh, uh, ragtime music, and I collected a lot of it, and I put a lot of it on tape. And when nothing else works, and when I get a, a little tired, and I can't get interest in anything else, I put on a tape or a CD of that music, and right away, I'm in another world. Without, without the music, I don't know what I, what I would do, but that really s sends me. <laughs> and uh, I also have to, re I, I had the problem of being lonesome after my wife passed away, everybody does. But I finally say that being lonesome is, is the same kind of a disease as feeling sorry for yourself. And, uh, and I said, I'm, I'm not going to f stop feeling sorry for myself. So. With the uh, games on the computer and with the other things that I do, and I have to take care of my apartment and I get my own meals some of the time. So when I start feeling sorry for myself, I go to work. I find something to do. Or put the music on and I'm all set. So, but but I, I find some old people that haven't found that solution and they, they lead kind of a miserable life sometimes. Well, maybe many of them are watching right now, and they'll take your wor wise words and they'll be inspired to find <laughs> things to do. Yeah. Well, uh, I have had a, a few, a few, a few comments on that, but there must be some more people that are hunted around so that I can, don't. Aren't the, I'm not the only candidate. That you well, there are, but you're our golden cane person in Hopkinton. So. Yeah, I, I have to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed at the publicity and the, and the things that happen uh, when, you, when you get, uh, I, have, I never grew up 
that wasn't my aim in life, let me say, you know. But so it, it happens, and, and uh, I, I've managed to adjust to it, and I'm happy to be uh, mobile and continent so far. You're doing great. Do you know we're almost out of time? Can you believe how fast this half hour has gone? Well, I told you it would fly by. There's so much I, I wanted I, to ask you about. Well, yeah, yeah. you're going to have to come back, you know. But I, I, I have been a little stingy about some of the, oh Lindbergh's flight, you know, the moon landing, and uh, these all these things that happened in my lifetime have been very significant and and. Uh, had us right on our edge, of course. Well, we mm -hmm. didn't cover very much of that this time. No, we I didn't. I guess we'll have to have another session. I think so. You know what? I think we should do a whole series. Well, <laughs> we'll take a decade at a time and do a whole series. I think each time they get a little better, and after we get through, I, I might tell the people that are watching it, after we get through, I think of a lot of things then, but that's a little bit too late. Well, I thank you for all the things that You're you welcome. did share with us today. And I'm serious. I think we should do a show, take 10, day, 10 years at a time. We'll call it decade one, two through. Well, I tell everybody I'm on my second hundred. <laughs> That's good. I'm so glad. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, thank you for sharing this half hour with Sterling and myself. I can't say enough of how much I loved hearing about your life, Sterling. Thank you. The changes, memories, and experience have now been captured to celebrate for a long, long time to come. Thank you to HCAM team for making this show possible, and thank you to the audience for watching. I hope you are inspired to live 100 years or more. I'm Mary Arnott, signing out with Attitude. I'm Dr. Pamela Weinfeld. I'm Dr. Louis Kushner. Our skin is the largest organ in our body and serves many functions, including protection, shock absorption, and temperature control. It's also subject to many disorders and diseases. Today, about one in three people suffer from skin ailments resulting in pain, disfigurement, or disability. The most serious of these conditions is melanoma, a potentially deadly skin cancer that affects some 115,000 people each year. Its incidence continues to rise, but the good news is that if detected early, melanoma is highly curable. Recognizing changes in your skin is the best way to detect melanoma, so examine your skin regularly. If you notice changes in a mole or other unusual conditions, contact your primary care provider. Avoiding excessive exposure to the ultraviolet rays of the sun is the most important step you can take to prevent skin cancer. Using sunscreen, wearing protective clothing, and avoiding tanning beds are important preventive measures. For more information on skin cancer and skin disease, visit skincarephysicians.com.